Welcome to the code review. Uh, glad to be here in the uh, coming to the end of uh, August. Got some really fun things happening in September that we'll talk about later. But uh, there's also been some really kind of uh, things pushing the, the boundaries recently. So let's get started talking about that. Uh, we have TraceMonkey, which came out from Mozilla um, about a week ago. This uh, came out of Brendan Eich and his team there at Mozilla. And it's a very, very, very performant JavaScript VM. Uh, it's using trace-based JIT VM for performance. And so what he's done is he's taken Tamarin and the Tamarin tracing portion of things, which has been uh, worked on by Adobe. Uh, and then Mozilla's kind of taken that and they've worked by taking these methods that you're going through and you're calling in your JavaScript stack and it finds hotspots. So if there's a particular branch in a method or something like that, it's going to go through and say, oh, and if this if clause, over here is always the hot path, so we're going to JIT compile it for you. And they're seeing very impressive performance gains. Of course, this comes uh, a few months later after Squirrelfish, which the uh, Apple team, the WebKit team, uh, developed that was also a new JavaScript engine that they're going to be putting in with WebKit and Safari, which also has very impressive gains too. And so we're seeing uh, browsers really take performance very, very seriously uh, indeed. And IE, with IE8 Beta 2, um, they've been talking a little bit about performance as well. And there's uh, anecdotal evidence today of how Gmail uh, runs faster in the browser. And that's an important thing, is the difference between the lab testing and the, the real testing. Um, both are obviously important to be able to do micro benchmarks and see where the uh, hotspots are and find that. But also, as Brendan talks about, uh, they're looking a lot at tuning things like DOM manipulation, because at the moment that's a big bottleneck. And a lot of people think JavaScript is slow, when in fact it's the DOM that is uh, that's is slow in the bottleneck. So they're working a lot on uh, doing extra caching, extra interesting things there. And once you've got this trace-based uh, system, they can kind of push code up uh, into JavaScript from the uh, C, C++ layer and get benefits out of that. So it's great to see uh, very solid JavaScript performance. Giz has a new release, 0.4 this week, that kind of uh, ties in here. You can obviously use worker pools uh, to do interesting things with that are uh, uh, UI responsiveness and performance in nature. But there's two kind of big things that people latched onto in this release. I'm going to talk about those. The first piece is geolocation. And uh, what's interesting there is that there are actually two slightly subtle uh, different things that we released. One was something that's part of the Ajax APIs uh, side of the house. All of the libraries for doing searches and feeds and video bars and all that great stuff. The infrastructure that Google has and giving you very simple APIs to access it. Well, they just uh, released this client location API that trivially gives you uh, an address, a bit of information on where the user is, where they are uh, with that browser. That uses IP uh, address technology to work out where they are, and it's just JavaScript. It's not using anything implicit to the device, but it doesn't need any kind of plugins or anything uh, on the system, and um, therefore you get uh, some notion of where the user is. There's definitely situations where you go through satellites and, and things like that, and sometimes it thinks you're in slightly different locations, and that's where the Gears API comes in. So Gears 0.4 gives you a geolocation API that lets you set up the different providers that you've got. So you can go through and say there's the IP address system on one hand, but there's also on the other hand, you know, GPS. And that's obviously very, very accurate indeed. And so if you're using a device such as Windows Mobile, and they showed this in a, uh, a demo using lastminute.com, with Windows Mobile, and gears, it's going to be able to have access to that GPS device. So it's going to give you very accurate uh, readings on where the user is. And then there's middle ground. There's using cell tower IDs to triangulate. We've seen if you've used the iPhone at all uh, in the first version before GPS was added in the iPhone 3G, you hit that little button and it still kind of works out where you are. Uh, and it does a you know kind of a remarkable job uh, at doing it considering there's no GPS in there. Then there's also uh, Wi-Fi IDs and doing things like that. So you've got this whole range of providers, different accuracies, depending on what's going on with your device, you can get access to different ones. But at the end of the day, is you're going to get some reading on where your users are. Now there's also a W3C standard for this geolocation. 
So there's this geolocation API that's been proposed in the W3C by uh, someone on the Gears team, Andre. And what's interesting about this is that we have bridged that gap. So I've written a little shim that allows me to use the W3C geolocation API and then behind the scenes if you've got gears installed it'll use gears uh, else it'll use the Ajax API. So uh, we're getting interesting access to uh, location data and already other people are building shims uh, that tie into this to access their back end all through one API as the JavaScript developer. So that's pretty cool. Speaking of standards like W3C, we've got a couple of interesting things happening there too. You may or may not have noticed we have a, uh, a new segment, State of HTML5, that's part of the What Working Group blog. Uh, this is something that Mark Pilgrim, who's uh, uh, a colleague on my team on the Open Web Group, and what he's doing is, um, believe it or not, there's actually a lot of information about HTML5 and how it's evolving and different things are getting put in. Ian Hickson does a great job of kind of getting information out. There's Twitter streams and you know watching the, uh, the documentation itself and all this kind of crazy stuff. But that's really hard to go through. So Mark is kind of you know taking one for the team for us and watching over everything that's happening in the spec, letting us know what's happening and kind of giving us a digest about once every week that tells us what's happening. So recently, I'll tell you, they've standardized on this piece of the navigator object. Here are the discussions they've had on this piece of the API. And it's really interesting to see kind of week by week how much it's progressing. Because, you know, I don't know about you, but I sometimes see that standards groups can be a little slow. But Ian is definitely, I'm sure it's not as fast as he was like, but he's pushing and pushing and we're getting to see the fruits of that labor. So we're really excited about HTML5 and now we can kind of track this and you can have a place where you can go to kind of see where the standards go in as, uh, as we really get there with HTML5, which is going to be very exciting. Where are we going to be talking about some of this stuff? Uh, I decided to set up a new podcast that you can go to uh, openwebpodcast.com and it's not only myself, Alex Russell of Dojo and SitePen and John Rezig of uh, jQuery and Mozilla Corp. Uh, we're all there together to just kind of chat about the issues on the open web that are happening. News, talking to different people. Uh, for example, last week we got Brendan Eich in uh, just when the uh, ECMAScript uh, Harmony project was kind of announced uh, and got out there. And we had a long chat about uh, starting off the history of uh, JavaScript, how it happened, and ECMAScript, how it evolved, and then moving on to the uh, Harmony uh, experience and what happened in Oslo that brought the two sides together. So if uh, you didn't know about this, there's kind of a lot of people that were proponents of this JavaScript 2 vision that was kind of like action script and uh, a lot richer and a lot more bold and a lot of new features. And then there were other people that were more into the, whoa, 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 let's wait a minute. JavaScript's actually a great language. Let's slow down here. Let's fix some of the warts, but we don't have to go hog wild. And now with Harmony, Harmony, these groups have kind of come together again. So very exciting for JavaScript. Uh, if you've been watching this and kind of uh, worried about what's happening with JavaScript 2, uh, I wrote a piece on how I, you know, I don't want this to be the Perl 6, for example, um, of JavaScript. And uh, things are actually coming together. And now it's a lot more hopeful uh, for what's going on the programming side uh, of the open web. There's great stuff happening in mobile. So Android just released 0.9 uh, version of their SDK that gives you a lot of new components, new look and feels, kind of really brings you up to date on uh, interesting ways that you can develop on the uh, Android platform. So if you're interested in mobile, looking to play around with Android, this is a big drop uh, with this SDK and a lot of fun new things for you to play with. And the mobile team is also working in different areas. Uh, we just released a new iPhone application that gives you Google Translate on the iPhone. So you're seeing kind of consistent uh, applications for the iPhone form factor uh, being developed in conjunction with uh, great things happening with the uh, Android platform itself. So again, exciting to see the progress being made on the uh, mobile side. App Engine on the server side is also doing great things and there was a, a recent post that I'll link to that details some of the changes to the data store API. So things that are happening there, uh, talking about future things with indexes and then being able to do batch write operations. So for performance reasons, being able to do a whole bunch of uh, writes in one batch instead of having to uh, separate them. And we're seeing a lot of very interesting additions into the various APIs. 
the open source world is doing some very cool stuff that you can check out on the open source blog. Uh, one piece of software that's kind of fun, we announced Keyzar. Uh, this piece of software, if you're used to cryptography, uh, you often find that you've got a lot of choices. What are you doing with different ciphers, different ways of uh, uh, doing your encryption, bit sizes for choosing keys and this that, and the other. There's all these myriad of choices. And uh, how do you know which one uh, to take on? Well, Keysar is there for you to kind of give you a package that makes sense for your scenario. So it's going to give you some defaults that make sense, make sure that you're secure, and kind of guide you through that process. So it's going to make the act of doing safe cryptography uh, a lot easier, a lot, lot less error prone. So definitely give that a, uh, give that a check out. Summer of Code is obviously drawing uh, more, more to an end, so we're starting to see more of the projects kind of wrap up and cool things that uh, these students have developed as they flip bits and not burgers. Uh, and one of the things recently talked about was uh, progress made by six members that were working on various sub-projects of Git, uh, the source uh, version control system. So you can uh, kind of see what's going on there. There was a nice podcast uh, talking to people about what, what's happening. So expect to see more and more out of the uh, Summer in Code guys as they, uh, they finish up. And hopefully they continue throughout the year too to uh, contribute and work with the open source community. So great stuff there. Going back to security and the uh, keys are piece, uh, someone from the uh, Swiss side of Google came in and gave a tech talk that's public that you can view on YouTube that I'll post that was all about internet users and various risk that we have associated with browsing. And it kind of goes into detail of the update mechanisms of browsers and plugins and uh, what's happening, how secure are we, different exploits that are out there. And it's kind of funny. We have this guy, Jeremiah Grossman, and we invite him to a lot of our shows. He's a web security guru. And he'll go through and show you all of these hacks and exploits and things to look at. And it's fascinating to kind of, instead of look at Jeremiah, sometimes turn around and look at the people in the audience and see them kind of dumbfounded, uh, open-eyed as they kind of see the light on, on all of the issues that are out there and how uh, complicated and somewhat scary uh, it can be. Uh, this will potentially give you some of those same feelings and kind of show you how important it is to be able to rev uh, the web faster. This is something that we've been thinking about uh, for a little while. How can we help get people moving? How can we get the IE6 users onto IE7? Firefox 2 to Firefox 3. Flash up to the latest Flash version, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, for plugins. And I've kind of come around to thinking that uh, I would actually love to see silent installs for my software to just get these updates. Because you think about the trust side of it, as soon as I install a piece of software, then I'm giving trust to the author of that software. And uh, at that point, I also may as well give them trust that they're going to keep me secure and uh, the onus will be on them to actually do that. And by giving that trust, they can then just give me these updates as things that come in. So definitely not uh, a trivial problem. As soon as you have an ecosystem based on a platform, it's hard to auto rev it. But that's definitely something that we're looking at and uh, excited to see in the community. How can we solve this and keep the web up to date so we don't get into issues with uh, the secure side of the web, botnets, etc. And uh, we actually start to do things uh, in a really good way. One little piece of fun, I don't know if you've seen the meme on YouTube that has this guy Matt who uh, goes around the world and does different dances. Well, uh, he actually came to Google and talked about the uh, different uh, uh, events and things that he did, why he did this, how he went around the world, different fun things. It's the kind of thing if you uh, need to chill out a little bit on a Friday, go ahead and uh, check this out. It's, uh, it's kind of fun. But then really to finish, there's some uh, really interesting things happening in September. Google Developer Day is kicking in again, and this time it's in Europe. And myself, I'm from London, I'm very excited to get back to London and then visit Paris and Munich and Madrid. And then after that, there's all of these stops in Italy and uh, Israel and the Czech Republic and such. Check it out. Uh, online. We have a post on the most recent registration uh, information. Sign up, come visit us. We've got a bunch of people coming over, a bunch of local people, and we're excited to just kind of see you guys chat about what you're doing on the web, uh, how we can help, what you'd like to see from us, and uh, just kind of sharing knowledge on uh, how we can do all of this fun stuff. I got to do it in Latin America recently, a ton of fun. It's always good to just kind of meet people and chat about stuff. So uh, I hope you show up and, and uh, join us for that. 
few other miscellaneous things that I'll put in the show notes. We just uh, had something posted by Mark Lukowski, who uh, is an absolute guru who uh, works on the Ajax API system. And uh, he just wrote up something that discusses how they built this really nice uh, widget system, uh, this really nice application component that gives you ele election coverage uh, information on uh, both Barack Obama and John McCain and it kind of details all of the Ajax APIs that they were able to just piggyback on and use and kind of gives you a, an insight into what's going on there. So thanks so much for your time, really appreciate it and uh, talk to you next time at the Code Review.